Okie doke, guys. Can you hear me okay? Good? Good? Awesome. Glad to see you. All your lovely faces. Hopefully, with the midterm and everything else, things are still going. But on the bright side, it's November now, which means that you got through October, which is probably going to be like typically just the busiest, harshest time. So, congrats on that. <laughs> well, anyways, so go ahead and get started as per usual. I posted the link on the CS 199 EMP, what do you want to see November 1st? That is today, last I checked, and it should be that all day. So you can follow the link, and it should take you to something that looks like this. And we'll go ahead and get started. So I have quite a few slides today because we've gone over like quite a bit, like lists and trees and recursion is quite heavy. But... We'll see how it goes, but if anything's unclear, feel free to stop me, grab my attention, just work some exercises. You guys can run the show. So, that being said, as per usual, here are your weekly links for giving feedback. So, EMP has their own anonymous feedback form, so just for this class. And then we also have a topic suggestion form, which is also anonymous. So you can use that for suggesting topics or song suggestions. Either is fine by me. But yeah, so pretty soon, as soon as we get through some of the thick of data structures, then we're going to have like a lot more fun. So we can do some of the more fun topics and stuff that you might want to see. So what have we done since last time? So lists, lists, and more lists. So we have linked lists, singly linked lists versus array lists plus bonus doubly linked lists. And then we've also seen trees and recursion. So we'll be going over, you'll have even more stuff with trees and recursion later on in lecture, but we'll also go over it here. So unless there are any questions, we'll go ahead and just jump right in. All right, so quick review on array list. Yes, so thanks Java, we don't have to write it ourselves. So again, array list is the array implementation of a list, so it has an internal array. So it makes for quick lookups where you can actually use an index, so of one lookups, but it's not the smartest design decision if you're trying to decide which data structure, if you're going to be adding a bunch of elements to the front of a list, a bunch. And then also, same with, so if you're just inserting at index zero every single time, there's a smart way to do that, but that's spoilers for singly linked lists. So if you want to, I'm always curious about source code, even though the API documentation should be well enough for you to use, but Proceed with caution, you can actually view the source code there. It takes you to, like, I think it's source. Um, I'll remember what the website, class path. So it'll take you to the actual source code of what is actually going on behind the scenes, which I think was interesting. But yeah, proceed with caution. Any questions on array lists? Yeah. So with the array list, you would just do it with like the normal type here. I'll actually um, go here. So you can see that it comes from Java util, and then class array list, and then this E is going to be whatever type is going to go inside. So yeah, so I don't. Have you guys gone over generic types? It was a lab. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. So basically, um, it has the, it will know how to work even when given um, arbitrary types. So the generic is kind of like, you could think of it as like a placeholder, but ultimately when you actually use it, you'll have to fill it in with whatever you want to use. So if you had some sort of object that you wanted to store, and then 
you would actually declare it as you would anything else, but you can just say array list, and then you can actually uh, use one of the other constructors where you can give it an initial capacity, because if we look at the source code, uh, we can actually see that um, the default capacity is 10, and I found a typo somewhere here. So default capacity, it says 16 over here, but it says 10 up here, so I'll have to look into that later. But I thought that was interesting. But yeah, we can give it an initial capacity, or we can give it what's called um, a collection. So if we had um, a collection of elements that we wanted to load into an array list, we could do that as well, but we're not worried about collections for now. So if we wanted to use one of those three, um, we can go ahead and And then IntelliJ is super spooky for us. Sorry, that's really tiny. Um, yeah, so actually the cool part about IntelliJ that I really like is if you hit Alt and then Enter, it'll allow you to import the class. And then sometimes I haven't figured out the exact touch that you need to do. Oh, yeah, so if you're outside of it, it'll pop up this, and it suggests array list for you, so you can hit Alt, Enter, and then it actually just pops it up there for you. So most of the time, if you're, giving, if you're working with something from the Java libraries like Util or IO, um, IntelliJ is smart enough to figure out like, um, what class you might want, and as you just saw over there, you can hit Alt, Enter, and it just throws it up there for you. But if you had to do that on Prairie Learn, Prairie Learn is not smart. But IntelliJ is nice for us. Yeah. Any other questions? Right. So with Prairie Learn, you're actually working in kind of a vacuum. So there might be existing code around it, which is yeah. why you might not always be declaring classes and everything else, but you'll still have to like do the constructor. So there might be code going on behind the scenes, which is why you wouldn't be able to import something, because if you're working in a vacuum, chances are you might, for instance, like if you have Fibonacci, you might only see this, but this top part is already here, and then you can't just have like random imports throughout your class. They have to be at the top, so that's why you wouldn't be able to for the most part in Prairie Learn. But if you were given a blank file, I believe that's okay, but I think that's a rare day in Prairie Learn where you have to implement completely everything. So there are metrics for that, but it still uses a Java compiler like everything else, so. Other questions? Cool. So linked list. Um, there are basically two things going on here. We have a bunch of items, and then they all link up to become a list. So now is a really, really good time to check your understanding of references because this is how they're going to be linked together. So if you understand the difference between what reference is versus when you declare an object and everything else, then you'll probably have a smoother transition into working with linked lists. But if things are still rough, you're in even more practice, so I can give you even more practice on references. So basically, a linked list is a list of what? So items. So items can be thought of as containers. Sometimes they're referred to as nodes. But basically, they're just some sort of container that is going to essentially serve two purposes, and two purposes only is storing the data and linking together. So storing the data would be the value. So oftentimes it's just going to be integers, but we also have objects and everything else. So we're just throwing those in the containers or the items. So just as like we've been putting them inside arrays, we can put individual elements inside each of the items. And then the next, so this is a little bit confusing, but next is actually the next item, so what the current item is pointing to. So this is how we're 
connecting everything, so the linked part. So this would actually be the reference to the next item that we would want to access. So it probably looks something along the lines of this. In this instance, I'm just having integer values. So public class item, and then if we wanted our data to be private, we set private int value. And then we actually have the reference to the next item, so private item next. And then we can have a constructor here where we just set the value and set next. So if we're doing this initially with one item, we could just set it to next to null. Um, and then as we add more items, we'll set next to whatever element that we wanted to point to. Questions on items? Cool. And then we can add some getters and setters as needed. So a what of items? So the list part comes in. So it's the collection of all these items together. So we're going to string or link these together to become the linked list. So at minimum, we're going to have an item that is the start of the list, so self-explanatory names are cool, so we're, we'll call it start. And it's, when it starts out null, we have an empty list. So we'll initially have this to start. So we'll have the item start, and then we can have something like add to front, where start is equal to new item, and then value start. So putting this all together, we can have something nice that looks like this. So we have our item class that we can actually nest inside, which is cool. And then we have our constructors in add to front, and I'm going to zoom in on this. Is that a bit better? Good enough? Want a larger? Cool. <laughs> I like that. Tis <laughs> good I can't pull up that phrase, but it won't stop me from trying. <laughs> so. Again, multiple constructors for the win, so we can just initially start it out as um, having start equal to null, but we can actually feed it in an array. So if we take an array of integers, we can actually reverse through the list if we're adding everything to front. And since we already wrote add to front, yay method reuse, so don't repeat yourself. Use add to front if you've already written it and you save yourself some time and some implementation. Questions there? So, array lists versus linked lists. So, now we're starting to not only learn how to program, but how to think like programmers and designers. So, depending on the use case, um, we get functionality or list functionality from both array lists and linked lists, but we need to keep in mind which one we want to use depending on what the purpose of our program is. So if we're going to be retrieving data a lot, we might want to use array lists because that's constant time operation versus linked lists. You might have to traverse through the entire list before you find what you're looking for. Meanwhile, if we're going to be adding a bunch of things specifically at the front, so if we don't care where they're going to go, like with insert, if there's a specific index, but if we just need to add for the sake of adding, linked lists would be appealing because it's just a constant time operation to add to front. Meanwhile, with array list, you'll have to re-implement the array every single time. Yeah? Um, because you just 
like say, I don't know exactly, but I guess like, uh, like at least in Python, like you just say like, um, like you say the dictionary at that key is equal to some value. Like you don't have to actually recreate the dictionary, and that's why the array uh, list is all of them, but not the Olympus. Mm -hmm. Since like a dictionary, a uh, uh, hash map, like it's kind of the same. Like you say at this key is equal to that value, but that make it all one. I know for um, looking up, it's all one because it's just it's the main type of key that has value. But for adding, um, I just was wondering if it's also all one. Um, like, sort of the best one to use because it's like all one, even though I definitely know it's not always going to be stored. Yeah, so adding stuff, um, so hash maps get um, a little bit complicated depending on the implementation. Um, I forget what the standard Java hash map is. We can actually look it up. I actually haven't used it. I used only eight and ten I'm curious. Yeah, let's actually look it up. I'm pretty sure your next MP has stuff to do with hash map anyway, so. Uh, how would I want to do this? Because I believe that the hashing function um, takes constant time, but. I don't see anything here. But I would assume so, but I don't want to lie to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'll actually prepare stuff on hash map. Uh, I think actually I was going to next week, but there's stuff like load factor and everything else. So, um, but I believe it, it will learn about like amortizing to constant time. And I believe that's what happens, but we'll say that for next week. <laughs> Any other questions? Cool. So doubly linked lists. So <laughs> I'm glad somebody laughed at that. <laughs> so now items have links to the next and previous items. And the doubly linked list as a structure as a whole has access to the start and the end of the list. So while this is cool for um, being able to access the front and back of the list so we can have constant times if we're adding to the front and the back, this becomes an issue with space. So with storing n integers, for example, array lists, um, you just have the n values. Meanwhile, with doubly linked lists, you have three n because you have one for the value and then the actual references I, um, are the same size as it's depending on which, um, like if you're working on a 32 bit or 64, but that's way technical details. But the actual references, even though they're not actual objects themselves, they still take up space. Space. So um, it's actually an integer size amount of space, so we'll actually need three times the space in order to implement a doubly linked list which for the most part with the stuff that we're doing, we don't have to worry about that at all, but if you're working on very finite memory, then that would be something that you would want to consider. So that would be more trade-offs. I'll jump back. So the items, again, you'll see that they look similar. So we have a value, but now we have a next and previous item. So we have two more, well, double the things or one extra thing to take care of. And then with doubly linked lists, in order to implement, we have a start and end rather than just having a starting item. Questions there? All right, so trees. So I don't know why I put those each time because I struggle saying it, but welcome to Dendrology 101, I think is how you say it. Dendrology. So as you can see, it actually kind of looks like an upside down tree and I worked very hard to create that, so <laughs> way too hard, thank you. But it basically, 
um, simulates a hierarchical tree structure. So we have the root value and then subtrees with children and a parent node and a bunch of other wonderful terminology that you're going to see is associated with a tree. So thank you, uh, Wikipedia, for most of these definitions and the tree. So we'll go ahead and jump into some terminology. So root, the top node in a tree, parent, a node that has one or more children, a child, which is a node that has a parent. So I, it's kind of a pain, the circular definition there. But basically, if it has children, then it's a parent. And if it has a parent, then it's a child. And then leaf, and nodes without any children. So the first time I actually learned about trees, uh, my professor actually, he just shouted, I have no children, therefore I'm a leaf which I wish somebody that wasn't part of computer science just walked in at that time, because I think that would have been really hilarious. But that's how I remember it. But I'm not going to scream it at you guys, because that's rude. And then so that brings you to edge. And then that's the connection between one node and another. So how we're going to link these all up if we're using linked list term terminology. Questions on? that set of terminology. So even more terminology. So level the number of connections between root and node. So it's easier to just eyeball for the most part. The definition makes it sound like way more intense than it actually is. Yeah, so um, this uh, depth would actually be like the level from like the root nodes to um, uh, whatever leaf that you're referring to. And then level could be just like any arbitrary node in between. So uh, root would be like level zero, then like um, the number of connections down to one of the root's children would be one. So that would be level one because everything starts at zero. And then, um, so depth, number of edges from the tree's root node to the actual node. So um, I forget if there's a quirk to remembering depth versus level because it all sounds kind of the same. But it's first, it's saying that referring to the number of edges versus levels. So. I don't know if that helps, but. Oh, for level, um, I would just think of it as something like if you just had an arbitrary tree just drawing. So these would all be on the same level. So kind of take that as it is, but I don't know, it's just more tree terminology. Yeah? Um, I believe that's a safe assumption to make. I'm sure there's a proof somewhere, but, um, or actually because it, depending on whether or not you started the root at level zero, if you went, so this being the root, and then this down here, the, this would be a depth of one because there's one edge. But this would also be a level one, but I'll have to check on that. And then, so height, the number of edges on the longest path between um, that node and a leaf. So the height of the tree would be the leaf to the root node. So depth will be going down and height will be going up, so to speak. So questions there? Cool. So binary tree. So these will be one of the most common tree structures that you'll see. So each node has no more than two children. So to be clear, because sometimes it gets confusing on if it's no more than two or exactly two, um, 
A binary tree can have zero, one, or two children and still be a binary tree. And it looks something like this, where we have the value that we're trying to store. And then we have pointers to the right and left um, child. So subtree is a tree within a tree. So all these that I have in colorful boxes, these would be examples of subtree that are all part of this larger, bigger tree. Pretty self-explanatory, yeah. Cool. So recursion. Brings me to, so with trees, you're gonna have a lot of recursion. And I know this meme's kind of dead, but I still like it, so I'm using it. <laughs> Cute. So basically, you break down a problem into small pieces, you solve the small pieces, combine all the small results, and get the problem solution. And then you make sure that you have a base case. Otherwise, that happens which it could be fun, but yeah, the, the first time is kind of fun or scary. I remember the first time I got stuck in an infinite loop. I didn't know that there was a stop button, so I just like slammed my laptop shut and it was just like, uh, I'm not destined for programming, <laughs> but it's fine. So just like infinite loops, you can have infinite recursion, but you can hit the stop button and it's fine. So what's actually going on here? So using something like summation of three, so I'll see how this goes on the whiteboard. So if we have somewhere in Maine calling summation of three, we jump in with three as int n, n is not equal to one, so we go to return n is equal to three plus summation of two, so n minus one. So then we go and call summation again. Two is not equal to one, so we jump to the else return two, because n is equal to two, plus summation n is equal to two minus one, so summation of one. So we call summation of one again, summation of one, n is equal to one, so we actually get to return one. So now we come back up to the callee, which was when summation of two was calling. So we return one, so two plus one, we return three. And then we come back to the summation of three, so we had just returned from this. So three plus what we return here, three. So three plus three is six, last time I checked. So whenever we return back from summation of three, we gathered up all the broken down um, subproblems and found that the summation is six. So basically, this function can't return until it knows all the answers. So we can see that right here that we don't re rely on a recursive call if n is equal to one. So that's gonna end up being our base case where we can actually start coming back from everything. And then this n plus whatever we get from um, additional functions starts bringing all of the subproblem solutions together where we get one larger problem solution. So does that make sense? Recursion's fun? Yeah. Oh yeah. So that's um, so typically um, that's because you probably did something with the infinite recursion, like over there, where um, 
you guys haven't learned too much about like the call stack or anything, have you? Okay, so a very high level um, thing of what's going on is that, so we have something, so let's say that this is main, and then main calls summation sum three. So this gets thrown on the call stack, so sum three, and then it needs to call sum two, so sum two, but this hasn't returned any result yet, so it's waiting on whatever sum two's result is. Well, sum two relies on another call to summation one, and so we have this stack building of all these calls that are waiting for results of additional calls that um, keeps going higher and higher and higher. So if we have something that um, requires either too much recursion or we get stuck in something that's infinite recursion, then the call stack is a very finite resource, so we don't have unlimited calls. So once we exceed the number of calls without returning anything and knocking the stack down, just as how like once we actually got to return one here, this call would go away, and then we would come back and return something, so this call would go away, and then this call would go away, so it shrinks down. Well, if nothing is shrinking down, then we're going to overflow if we exceed the stack's capacity. So that would be what a stack overflow is. It overflowed the stack with calls. Does that make sense? Kind of cool. Yeah? Yeah, so I believe it's um, whatever would be defined in the Java virtual machine because that's the thing that's actually running the Java code and determines everything. So um, you wouldn't want to like create resources that are almost to the capacity of your machine because if something goes wrong, then your entire machine's going to go down. But I believe that the Java virtual machine is the one that defines it. But I can look that up and get back to you on that. So the timeout error, like the stuff that you might have seen in Prairie Learn or like when you're um, testing your code for like an MP or something like that. So those are actually um, exceptions that we define. So um, whenever we say timeout error, we actually define what the timeout is. So um, that would be uh, user defined. I, like, if you watch whenever, um, let's say you're running the code by yourself in um, main, so if we did something just like, All true. I'll give this a second to build. So this is actually going to run forever. And since we haven't actually defined a timeout for ourselves, Java is just going to do that until we hit stop. And then we exit with negative one because it didn't exit on its own. But um, so to prevent this from happening when you're running your test code, we define timeouts where it's just like, okay, your code should have finished by now, so it's user defined. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. So what's actually going on here as we saw before? So uh, base case, this arrow should be higher up, but um, so we want to make sure that we can stop at some point, 
And then um, we have the recursive step. So I don't know why all these arrows got off, but basically the recursive step is referring to calling summation again. So each time we wanna make sure that we're getting closer to the result. So if we forgot the minus one, then we're not decrementing N every time. So we're just going, in this case, going to be calling summation of three every single time and not making any progress. But since we're making sure that we get closer to the solution each time, we also want to make sure that we combine the results because all of the subproblems that we're creating, we want to make sure that we get to the overall solution. So the n plus, so summation of something, we add the results together. Yeah. So that's what we end up getting and what we can actually see with summation. Cool on summation? Cool. So real quick on Fibonacci. So because there seems to be a law where you have to talk about Fibonacci in at least one example when talking about recursion. So what's actually happening over here is that um, we are going to end up taking care of all of these calls to Fibonacci of n minus 1 and recurse on those, and then we have to come back up and go down on the other. So we actually have two recursive calls going on and combining the results of the two of them. And then in this case, with um, n is less than or equal to 1, it's nice to have some safeguards in there just in case the user gives bad input because I don't know if you noticed with my last example, I just gave n is equal to 1, but there are no restrictions on what n could have been. So that's another way that you could get stuck in infinite recursion is that if you don't take care of some of the cases. So if I fed in n is equal to 0, this is going to go on forever because it's never going to be equal to one, it's just going to go to negative infinity and be a bad time. So not only do you have to worry about the base cases, but think about some of the other inputs that you might want to consider. Edge, Edge cases, yes, you like those words. Well, not when we have to consider them, but when we're critiquing others, like did you consider this edge case? Questions there? No. Oh, cool. So I have some practice for you guys. So I'll turn over the next hour for however you guys want to spend it. But I know that some people were interested in possible leak code practice problems slash stuff that prepares you for uh, like internship interviews and all that. So I tried to find a couple of them related to, well, this one's a binary search trees. Um, and then I also have a really frustrating one with singly linked lists, but I do know that a company that, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say, but rhymes with uh, Boogle that um, asked me, a question very similarly to this one. So um, those are some of the things that you'll see in um, basically a lot of the stuff as soon as you learn a couple data structures, then you're going to be able to answer a lot of industry questions. So Leak Code is a decent place to start. Yeah. So this is all about um, the reference manipulation. So you have just like a bunch of um, temporary references and you basically have like a placeholder as you're flipping the next um, to the previous one. And it's just, it kind of reminds me of just like knitting, but for programming where you kind of throw one reference over here, spin this reference around, and then take the other reference off, and then you're left with a beautiful reverse linkless blanket or something. I can only knit rec rectangles, so blankets and scarves, I can do that. But yeah, so that, 
that's one of the biggest um, or at least most common um, question that I've seen and others have seen. So it's a good one. It's frustrating, especially when you're first learning, fair warning. But if you can reverse a part of a linked list, then I say that you know linked lists very well. I would just start out with reversing it overall or just like finding an element and all that other stuff that you've seen in your homework. I wonder if you would have been allowed to do that. I, like, I don't know why they. Yeah. I don't know. I think they would commend like originality and creative thinking. So I don't know. But if they say like constant space, then yeah. might run into issues. But oh, so. The rest of the time is yours to how you see fit. I'm here to answer questions if you have any. Yeah. Uh, actually, I have a question from the elevator back, and this is about the uh, joker. Yeah. So that. There's a documentation. The template? Yeah, so let me read over this. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, so I think the strategy you would um, have some sort of while loop that is just like why there are no more possible paths than like a similar approach to recursion, but just have a way of marking that that you have no more options. But. So I have a more general question. Yeah. So that the the uh, fastest answer that I have is just um, like thinking like a designer on what seems more appropriate, especially after you get more practice with recursion, because probably right now, if this is the first time that you're seeing it, you'll just want to do everything iteratively still, because recursion can be scary the first time. And for me, I now get too excited with recursion, where um, it's just you're like, um, I can't think of an example offhand, but uh, sometimes with when you're trying to implement something recursively, you're making an excessive amount of calls than you would have needed to. Meanwhile, with 
like using iteration, um, you had a more straight shot to the solution. So it depends on um, how many calls that you're gonna make or if you can do it like successfully, say using a loop or something, so. Yeah, so Fibonacci gets really bad with recursion, yeah. So Fibonacci is actually one of those where um, I believe that the iterative is um, better than the recursive, but it's just the quintessential recursion question, but I'll have to think about that. But um, long story short is more along the lines of just um, thinking about um, efficiency and you might not realize some things until after you implemented it and been like, oh, that would have been way more efficient had I just done it iteratively. But um, it, it'll kind of, yeah. Whenever we go over sorting and stuff, there are iterative sorts versus recursive sorts. So maybe your question will be better answered then. So. I'll be fine. So does that make clear that Mallory, the problem of having to solve the words iteration, can also be solved with recursion? Is that correct? Ah. Uh, yeah, but I mean, it would be kind of the same because they could. Because yeah. like, I'm pretty sure, pretty sure every recursive recurs solution can be done iteratively. So I don't know if every. If you take your claim universally, that's very clear. It's not correct. Uh, every problem of having to solve the words recursion. <laughs> I can't actually think of counter arguments to either one of those. That would be fun to figure out. <laughs> yeah, that too. Go Google that. But yeah. Oh, sure, yeah. So I think I had a couple of them. So there's minimum depth of a tree. Uh, given two trees, are they the same? Um, given a, I think this one's fun. This might be a little bit difficult right now, but given a sum, uh, seeing if there's a path that adds up to the sum. So adding up all the nodes in a tree. So let's say you're given like seven or something. Is there a path where you can get from the root node to a leaf? Um, or is it to leaf or is it any arbitrary node? I forget. Root to leaf. So um, here's the example that they have. So if sum is equal to 22, there's a path, 5, 4, 11, 2, which sums up to 22. So that was kind of fun. And then, obviously, you might want to switch it to Java since we're learning Java, but if you want to try it in other languages, you can try it in Swift or Scala. So yeah. Just a couple different options and might prepare you for future MQs. <laughs> <laughs>